All right, we're going to start a series of expository studies now on the book of Galatians. We're going to start out today with chapter 1. You can go there in your King James Bible if you want to. And what I have here, I have all my scriptures typed out on this page so I can go through it pretty rapidly. So I am going to turn to it here in my Bible, my King James Bible. But uh, if you don't have time to turn to it, you know, you can always pause the video. So one of the advantages of, of watching things like this on video because you can actually pause things and go to the Bible if, if uh, you're not real quick. You don't know the Bible, the books of the Bible that well yet or whatever, you know, there's time to pause things. But let's start out here in Galatians chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. It says here, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Now, if you're familiar with this ministry, you know that one of my strong stands that I take is that buildings that are called churches are not real churches. Okay, The church is the people. And so when you see the thing here, churches of Galatia, this is a reference to groups of Christians, not to buildings. All right, that's so important to get. Give you and, and you can do a study like this on your own. Look up all the words, all the references to church or churches. But I'm going to give you just a couple here, three of them actually, to prove the fact that the word church or churches is a reference to people, not to buildings. Acts chapter 9 verse 31 says, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. Acts chapter 15, verse 41, And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. How do you confirm a building? And up there in uh, chapter 9, verse 31, the churches had rest. How does a building rest? Romans 16, verse 16 says, Salute one another with an holy kiss. The church of Christ, churches of Christ salute you. Again, how does a building salute? See, the churches of Christ there are references to people. Saved, born again Christians. That is what the Bible term church means. And it's funny because your modern day church building a lot of times has lost people coming to it. They're encouraged to come to it. Hey, we'd like to invite you out to our church. See? Why? For the purpose of evangelism. That practice is totally far into the pages of the King James Bible. So when you get somebody that's pressuring you, telling you, you have to go to church, go to church, that phrase, go to church, does not appear in the King James Bible. You're dealing with somebody that is, that is teaching something that's extra biblical. Extra biblical and, in fact, unbiblical. Watch out for that. But let's go back to Galatians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Here, we'll read these. It says, Grace be to you in peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. Now, how does God deliver us from this present evil world? Well, he does it in two ways. First of all, God delivers us from sin. Okay? Okay. Romans chapter 6, you can turn there in your Bible. We're going to start at verse 1, go down to verse 7. But I mean, really, if you want to go through the whole uh, chapter there, Romans chapter 6, you'll see this thing of when you get saved, now that old man that you were before is dead, and you don't have to live in sin anymore. So part of the thing that God delivers us from, he delivers us from that life of sin. Let me show you. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. So you say, well, bless God, glory to God, then that means that, you know, when you have the old nature eradicated, you won't live in sin anymore. I didn't say that. Go on to read Romans chapter 7. You'll see that that's certainly not true. 
Uh, as a Christian, you're always going to struggle with sin. Uh, just the way it is. That's just the nature of the corruptible flesh that we live in. You will always struggle with sin. But here's the point. When you get saved, all right, let me say it this way. Before you get saved, you have no real ability within you to fight sin. And what you'll see is you'll see some lost person, and yeah, they might not be a drunk, but they'll be wrong in some other area. They'll have a problem with fornication. They might not be a fornicator, but they'll have problems with covetousness. They might not have a problem with idolatry, but they'll be into, you know, uh, whatever, hatred, uh, whatever. See, there's always going to be some kind of a thing that the lost world struggles with. They cannot overcome that sinful flesh. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's not in them. But when you get saved, you got to understand one of the things that happens at salvation when you come to God is as a repentant sinner. And that's so very important. When you preach to the lost world, you preach to them a need for repentance, understanding that you are a sinner and that you deserve to go to hell. Understanding that. Understanding that you can never be good enough to get to heaven by your own good merits. That is the key to salvation there. True biblical repentance. All right. And a lot of people are backing off on the thing of repentance, just saying, it's only believe, only believe, only believe. And what's happening is you're having people that are in their sins and in their pride, and they say, I am not giving up my sinful life, and I'm going to get saved, I'm going to be a Christian, and continue in my sins. Give you a good example. Sodomite professing Christians. They're not saved. You cannot do something that God calls an abomination in his word, and have it as your lifestyle, and tell me that you're saved. I don't believe that for one second. No way. Not going to happen. See? But that's what's going on today. We have this this thing. All these guys, and a lot of them are, are you know, King James only, Bible-believing, you know, brethren. And they're saying you should not preach repentance to the lost world. That is heresy. And you know one of the other reasons why it's heresy? Because true biblical repentance, saying, I'm a sinner... I put my faith in Jesus Christ, and now I'm going to have a changed life after that. You know, I'm supposed to have a changed life. That's a joy, right? You get somebody that's messed up in sin, and you and they're going, I have no way to get out of this alcoholism. I have no way to quit looking at pornography. I have no way to quit whatever, whatever your sin is as a lost person. It's a wonderful thing to know, hey, the Holy Ghost can come in, and those sins that are causing you to be damned to hell right now, after your salvation, the Holy Spirit can come along and actually help you to fight those sins and to get that out of your life. You can actually be delivered from this present evil world, as it says there in Galatians chapter 1, verse 4. You can be delivered from that. You don't have to spend the rest of your life in sin. All right? It's a wonderful thing to preach repentance. Repentance is such an important just requirement for a Christian. Repentance is not an option. Not an option at all. And when you get these people that are saying, repentance is preaching, repentance is heresy. That's very dangerous. But what about the second thing? I said that there are two things that God will deliver you from in terms of deliver us from this present evil world. First is from sin. The second one is from death. All right. What's the result of sin? Let's look at Romans chapter 6. If you're still there, Romans chapter 6, verse 21, it says... What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, those sins that you committed in your lost life were leading to your uh, premature death. And the more sins that you do in the flesh, the closer and the quicker it will hasten your death. Why? Because you are sinning and you are earning wages. And the wages of sin is death. You say, give me some examples. Okay. Drunkenness. What's drunkenness? Drinking too much alcohol. What does drinking too much alcohol do? Well, it causes you to lose control of yourself, to lose control of your senses, which means you can have vehicle accidents. You can do things that are dumb. You can even fall down the steps, walking out of the bar, fall down the stairs and, and you know, smash your nose into the pavement, break your nose or whatever else. There have been a lot of cases of that. 
I remember reading a story the one time, I think it was in Charles Chiniqui's book, 50 Years in the Church of Rome, and he told this story about a young woman who was having problems with alcohol. She was a drunk, and she had this little girl, or I think, little girl or boy, I forget, but her little baby, and she was walking around with this baby, and she was tipsy because she had been drinking, and all of a sudden she lost her balance because of being drunk, and she fell down, and that baby's head hit the corner of a fireplace, a stone sticking out, and it busted the baby's head open. The baby died. I mean, went through the skull into the brain I'm talking about here, not just cut. I'm talking killed the baby because she fell with all of her weight on the baby. You say, what happened? The wages of sin is death. I'll give you another one, cirrhosis of the liver. You drink too much alcohol, it'll destroy your insides. Poke a whole bunch of little holes through your liver. Kill you quicker. It will hasten your death. Um, what about pornography? How about that one? You look at more and more and more pornography, you get more and more perverted. It takes more and more perversion to for you to get your thrill. You know, what happens? Well, you end up going out and raping somebody or you have no real true relationship with a wife, you know, if you're a man or a husband, if you're a woman, you know, and it hastens your death. You end up dying sooner as a result. You say, what about covetousness? Okay. Well, the Bible says, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You know what covetousness will lead you to do? It'll lead you to work harder, put in more hours so you can make more money. And then you get yourself in debt because you're coveting all these nice things. And now you got to work harder to pay off the debt. And then you get more debt. And then you get, you know, what, what are you doing? You are dying sooner. Why? Because of covetousness. The wages that you are earning of that sin that you are committing is going to lead to your premature death. I mean, I've seen people that are in their 50s and they look like they're in their 70s. Why? Because they work all the time. They're destroying themselves. They're destroying their health. See, any sin that you do in the flesh will lead to your untimely death. But here's the point. You don't have to live the rest of your life in sin if you're a Christian. You don't have to do that. But there's another aspect to this thing of delivering you from death. That salvation that came upon us can also deliver us from, you know, not just dying a premature death, but actually death itself. Let's look at this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You go there in your Bible. If you know about the rapture, you probably know where I'm going with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we'll start at verse 50 says here, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality... Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Hmm. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Kind of like being delivered from this present evil world. That'll be great when the rapture happens. Then you don't have to worry about sin. You know, we think about all the good things that are going to happen at the rapture, you know, and we think I uh, get to see saved loved ones, you know, get to see the heroes of the faith and things and all the martyrs that were killed by the Roman Catholic Church. All that stuff, and that's going to be great. And actually seeing Jesus Christ for the first time, I mean, wow, that's going to be wonderful. But guess what? One of the things I'm really looking forward to about the rapture, no more temptation to sin. <laughs> Won't that be nice? You know, I mean, no more, no more lust, no more covetousness, no more, you know, whatever. Over. Over. <laughs> wow. And why do we have that? <clears throat> Excuse me. Why do we have that promise? Oh, because we're good people? No. Because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross to pay for our sins. That's why. It's a wonderful thing. God truly has delivered us from this present evil world. If you're saved, if you're lost, well, you're still in the present evil world. 
I'm sorry to tell you that, and you're not going to get out of it until you get saved. Galatians chapter 1, verse 5, we'll continue here. It says here, To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Do you ever wonder what we're going to do when we get to heaven? You know, I mean, there's some things in the book of Revelation that you look and you say, well, okay, you know, it's kind of like I can see this and I can see that. And of course, you know, you read the different verses there in, in uh, the Pauline epistles about the judgment seat of Christ. That'll be there, you know, different things. But what are we going to do, not just during the time of Jacob's trouble, but throughout eternity? What are we going to be doing? I just read about it there in Galatians 1 verse 5. To whom be glory forever and ever. Not to whom be glory when, you know, for the first three months after your salvation, then you just kind of, you know, forget about it and take God for granted. Uh-uh. Forever and ever. Turn, turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 4, verse 9. Revelation chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. We'll read these verses here. Okay, it says, And when those beasts give glory, glory, you see it there, and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. That's going to be the most wonderful thing. You know what heaven's going to be? Bringing glory to Jesus Christ forever. Worshiping, praising the name of Jesus Christ for all of eternity. That's what heaven is. It's wonderful. You know, a lot of people, again, they have this very perverted, uh, I don't mean sexually perverted, I mean a very twisted idea of what heaven is. You know, if if you like the mountains and, and the cabins and, and hunting and fishing and hiking through the mountains, that's going to be what I'll have for all of eternity. Uh, no, heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. Okay, when you get there, it's not going to be just like, hey, you just, you know, go have fun, you know, just do whatever you want. Whatever you liked on earth, you'll get it here times 10. No, that's not what it's going to be. What heaven is going to be is service to Jesus Christ. First of all, the judgment seat of Christ when we get up there. Okay, be with the Lord. There's going to be the judgment seat of Christ. Then you're going to have the marriage of the Lamb. And then we come back down with Jesus Christ and your service here in this life will determine your rule in the millennial kingdom. Okay, after the millennium, eternity begins. It's going to be amazing. Well, I should say after the millennium will be the great white throne judgment, the final judgment of Satan and anybody who's lost that's ever lived. You know, think about that one. Every single person who's ever been lost, we're going to see again at the great white throne judgment. Every Hollywood celebrity that's ever damned people to hell because of the lifestyle that they've lived, all these rock stars and stuff die premature deaths because of messing with sin. They had no way to fight it, you know. Holy Spirit's not in them. Every single celebrity, you're going to see Adolf Hitler and, and uh, every pope that's ever lived coming up at the great white throne judgment. Every single one of them. So why is it that Christians a lot of times will worship these people? Why is it that you go, oh, you wouldn't believe it. You will not believe it. I saw such and such TV personality at the store today. Oh, I was so amazed. You know why? Because you're under mind control. <laughs> and I'm going off on a tangent here. But the fact is, folks, they're going to show up at the great white throne judgment. And if you're saved, you're going to be up there at the right hand of the Lord over there. And you're going to look down there and you're going to say, boy, I used to think that they were somebody. Now look at them. They're nothing. Nothing at all. You know? And we get to go into eternity, bringing glory and praise and worship to Jesus Christ forever. It's wonderful. But let's go back to Galatians. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now see, this is why it's so important to understand, to read context into verses. Because right here, you could actually say a contradiction. Look at this. Verse 6, unto another gospel. Verse 7, which is not another. Huh? It's another gospel, but it's not another. What's going on here? Well, you keep reading. See? 
That's why you read context. When people try to tell you there are contradictions in the Bible, look at context. Look at and say, okay, study the thing out. Don't be quick to give up on the Word of God. And I'll tell you right now, I've said it before, I have never seen a real contradiction in the King James Bible. Okay? I've never seen a real one. But look at this thing. Another gospel, which is not another. Now look at the end, end part of verse 7. And would pervert the gospel of Christ. Hmm. So this gospel that these this false gospel that's being brought is a perversion of the true gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, could you give me some examples? I was hoping you'd ask that. Number one, I'm going to give you five different perverted gospels of Jesus Christ. Number one, salvation with no changed life. A repentantless gospel. Okay? No repentance associated with the gospel. No changed life. You know, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You become a new creature. It's salvation. But these people, they say, I got saved and there was no change. You know? See? That gospel is a perversion of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, what's the point of getting saved if you just continue the way you did before you got saved? I mean, what about Romans chapter 6? Saying that you're not to live in sin anymore. The old man is dead and buried with Christ. Well, what's the point of that? The old man's dead and buried with Christ, but the old man still exists. Huh? No, there needs to be a change. There needs to be evidence of your salvation. All right? And, you know, I'm not going to judge somebody that's just been saved for, you know, three or four months. They might have problems with, you know, pornography or something like that. Or they might still be smoking. They might still get have some drinking problems or covetousness problems or something like that. I'm not going to judge somebody like that. But if I see somebody that's been, quote unquote, saved, and they've been saved for 10, 15, 20 years, and they're still having the problems as a perpetual lifestyle, and you try to confront them and they get mad at you, you know, who are you to judge me? You're dealing with a lost person, a false convert. How about another perverted gospel? How about good works to get saved? You know, I get accused of this. People say, oh, Brian Nellinger teaches work salvation. Uh, I don't teach work salvation. I teach that you have to come to God as a sinner. No more self-righteousness. No more thinking that you're good enough to get to heaven. That's not work salvation. Okay, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Why would you boast about being a sinner? Coming and saying, I'm no good, I'm filthy, I'm rotten, I'm disgusting, I deserve to go to hell. That's not boasting. You know what people boast about? I'm a member of such and such church, and I'm I'm a deacon, and, and I've taught Sunday school for 30 years, and, and I was baptized, and I give to charity, and I, see? And you go to those types of people, and you say, are you saved? Well, of course I'm saved. God wouldn't damn somebody, a fine person like me to hell. That's good works for salvation. Coming and saying to somebody, hey, you need to get saved because you're wicked and you're vile and things like that. You need to give up that sinful life when you become a Christian. Not before, but after you get saved, you need to give up that sinful life. You just need to admit to being a sinner right now. Just be honest with God. That's not weak work salvation. Okay. Number three, how about keeping the law to stay saved. That's what's going on here in the book of Galatians. We're going to see that as we get into the other chapters. These Jews were coming and they're trying to get the Gentile believers back under the law, trying to pull them back under the law. And whenever you see somebody coming out and trying to tell you that you have to keep the law to stay saved, you're dealing with a false convert most of the time or somebody that's very ignorant. All right. Another one that I want to just kick while I'm on this subject Watch out when you have people trying to tell you that you have to keep the Sabbath day right now. Watch out for that. Okay, you might be dealing with somebody that's non-dispensational, you know, and, and anybody that would teach that is non-dispensational because nowhere in the Pauline epistles are you told to keep the Sabbath day. Only back in the Old Testament, you know. Very interesting. And, of course, in the future, with the time of Jacob's trouble, they go back under that system there where... The commandments are reinstituted, I believe. And 
they do have to keep the Sabbath day. Why? Because it's the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob is another name for Israel. So that thing of the Sabbath day is given as a sign between God and the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. So, yeah, it does come back then. But it's interesting because all these people today that are trying to tell you that the Sabbath day is the only day that you're supposed to worship and all this stuff, they'll tell you that, but then they don't carry out the second part of the keeping the Sabbath day, which is if anybody works on that day, you kill them. See, they don't keep that part. You see somebody working and say, hey, go kill that guy. He just picked up a stick. Well, you know, no, we're not going to do that. Why not? You just said we're supposed to keep the Sabbath day. Nothing ever changed there. In spite of the fact that numerous places in the New Testament they're meeting on the first day of the week. Okay? Kind of interesting. But you see, anybody that's trying to get you back under the law, again, it's a perversion. They'll teach you that Jesus Christ is your Savior and whatever, but they'll say you have to keep the law to stay saved. Watch out for people like that. Another perversion of the gospel of Christ would be dying in a state of belief. These are people that deny eternal security. People that say to you, you know, uh, well, if you if you go out and you sin, you know, you get involved with drunkenness and whatever else, you know, and you stop believing in things, and you're going to go to hell. You know, you're, you've lost your salvation. Uh, no, you know, you better be real careful about that. The Bible does teach eternal security. Okay, if you live after the flesh, you will die. All right. If you mess around with the flesh and the lust of the flesh, those wages that you're going to earn from that will lead to your premature death, but you won't lose your salvation. You know, again, a lot of people get confused on that issue. You know, they, they say again that I'm teaching, you know, there's no eternal security or something like that. I don't teach that. You know, watch my study on questions on eternal security and you can see the stand I take on that. You know, I'm not teaching that. All right? When it's fleshly sins, when it's things that you mess around with your flesh, you're not going to lose your salvation. Okay? Number five, how about believing in a false Christ? That certainly is a perverted other gospel, you know? And you talk to the average modern Christian, the, you know, Christ that they worship is actually the Antichrist. You know, he's this nice, loving, friendly guy that doesn't judge anything or anybody. You know, that's the Antichrist. And again, I've talked about that in other studies, so I'm not going to cover it in real great detail here. But the fact is, you got to watch out for this thing of this Christ that just doesn't judge anything and he's okay with everything and all this stuff. Uh, that's not the Jesus Christ of the Bible. So watch out for that. But let's go here to back here to Galatians chapter 1, verse 8. This is also very important here. It says, But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. All right? Now, a lot of the brethren there again are saying that the gospel that we have right now is the gospel that goes on into eternity. That doesn't work for two reasons. Number one, right now there's nothing that you can do in terms of taking the mark of the beast. I'll just go ahead and say it. If you take the mark of the beast in the time of Jacob's trouble... You lose your salvation, and you can't get saved. You can't say, well, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Nope. You take the mark of the beast, you worship the beast, that whole system there, you lose your salvation if you had it. All right? Big problem. All right? Secondly, when you go into the millennial kingdom, you say, we're justified by grace through faith. Wait a second. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. It's the evidence of things not seen. It says there in Hebrews chapter 11. How can you have faith in Jesus Christ when Jesus Christ is physically on the earth? See, it goes to work salvation in that millennial kingdom. That's why you read in Matthew chapter 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount there, you're reading basically the plan of salvation, the, the way people are supposed to live in that millennial time period. Okay, That's why you never see anything about faith in the blood of Jesus Christ in that entire passage. So again, there's going to be this thing of believing in Jesus and obeying Jesus and things like that in the future, but to teach that our gospel today is what continues on into eternity, that's wrong. That's heresy. You know? But notice Paul says there, though we or an angel preach. Is there a time when an angel is going to preach? Yeah. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. 
says here, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven, and earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. Okay? He is preaching the everlasting gospel. And see, this is so very important. Because what's going to happen in the time of Jacob's trouble, you're actually going to have people crossing dispensational lines and coming back and saying, look, it says that you're sealed under the day of redemption. And you can see here, Paul says, it's by grace through faith. Faith alone, friends. So you can take the mark of the beast. I mean, go ahead and take it because after all, look what Paul says. It's like, wait a second though. Because you see, the, an angel shows up there and he's preaching another gospel. He's preaching now the everlasting gospel. And if you go on there in Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11, and you know you can actually go to verse 12. If you're there in Revelation chapter 14, let me show you something here. Revelation 14, 9 through 11 talks about if you're taking the mark of the beast, if you're worshiping the beast, you go to hell. All right? But look at verse 12. It says, Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Two different things. What is the main commandment of God in that time? Don't take the mark. Don't worship the beast. So you say, well, I have faith in Jesus, but I'm going to take the mark. I mean, think about something. I could preach a little, little false sermon that an Antichrist spirit, a servant of the Antichrist could do. I'll say it this way. Okay, rapture happens, body of Christ is gone now, the time of Jacob's trouble is there, the Antichrist is over in Jerusalem, you know, and with ruling with the Roman Catholic, you know, Pope and the whole papal system and everything, because that's what it's going to be. And he's over there, and he's, you know, one of his ministers says uh, to people, you know, you need to just, you know, you need to take the, the, the Pledge of Allegiance to the Antichrist, or, you know, to the, the Christ, you know, and you need to take this mark. You need to take this, you know, biochip, verichip, you know, whatever QR code upon your forehead, whatever the thing is going to be. I mean, there's a lot of technologies that they could use currently to make the thing happen. Um, whatever it is, you need to take this thing. Because after all, it says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So if you don't take the mark, you're not going to be providing for your own. And the Bible says right there, you've denied the faith and you're worse than an infidel. And it does. It does say that. See? Now, if you're non-dispensational and you make it into that time of Jacob's trouble because you weren't really saved, how are you going to deal with this stuff? See, a false prophet in that time period, the time of Jacob's trouble, could take people back here under what was written to us in the church age and use this verse to prove that you should take the mark of the beast. Think about that. And Paul, the thing that he says here in the book of Galatians is, he says, though we or an angel preach any other gospel. And guess what? God sends an angel in Revelation. Book of Revelation there, chapter 14, we just read about Very interesting. But let's go back to Galatians chapter 1, verse 9. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. All right? And you say, what about this thing of other gospels? You know, is that, okay, I can see that there will be another gospel in the, in the future in the time of Jacob's trouble and stuff, and we have these five other types of other gospels, you know. But is this really a danger? I mean, is this something big. We'll turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. We're going to read that. This is very interesting things in here too. It says, Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, interesting, just like what's going on here in Galatians, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. 
You know, I've seen that thing. I've seen that thing, unfortunately, with some of my subscribers. I've seen people that they're here on the channel. They just got saved. They're newly saved and everything else. And they're, they're you know, watching the videos and they're commenting on the videos and things. And, well, I didn't know this. And praise the Lord, you know, I'm learning this and learning that. And they'll go to other channels that are Bible-believing and they'll, and they'll learn things from them. But then I'll get these private messages from them and they say, you know, I... I, I've been watching this guy over here, and he's really kind of raising some questions, and I, I really don't know what to think, and I'm thinking, oh boy, here we go. And, you know, I'll warn them. I try to warn people as much as I can. That's why I, I kick false prophets a lot of times, just because I'm trying to warn you, and don't go over there, you'll get messed up. But I see this thing, and these people, they'll, they start listening, they start having doubts, and before you know it, they bear well, or they uh, well bear with him. You know, like he says there in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4. You know, they're preaching another Jesus. They're preaching another gospel. They preach another spirit. See? And by the way, those guys that are doing that, these, these really wicked false prophets out there that are messing Christians up and preaching a false gospel, Galatians 1, 9 says, let him be accursed. All right? Those guys are accursed ministers of Satan. And by the way, if it's uh, if it was going on back then in the first century, you can believe, you can, you know, bet your life it's going on right now in the end times. But going back to Galatians chapter one verse ten, it says here: For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Absolute total. Truth. If you are a man pleaser, you will never please God. Cannot happen. That doesn't mean that you have to go out there and try to pick fights with any Christian out there. You can never agree with anybody. That's not what's going on here. What's going on is when you get into ministry of any kind, you have to just simply say, I know what the Bible says. I know what is right. And I'm going to say that. Because I'm going to please God. And if it pleases some people, praise the Lord. If it makes everybody mad, well, sorry about that. But if I am if I know the Bible is right, if I can see what the Scripture says, you know, then I'm going to go with that. And again, I've taken a lot of stands and people get mad at me because I step on some pet, dro pet doctrine that they have. And I say, okay, I'm wrong for this. You're saying I'm wrong? Yes, you're wrong. Okay, what does the verse mean? What, is these, what do these Scriptures mean? And they'll give me some ridiculous explanation. I say, that's not what it means. You're contradicting this or contradicting, you know, it's not lining up here. And they, you know, well, uh, whatever you, you know, sorry, I'm not a man pleaser. I'm not. I never have been. And, I, and by God's grace, I never will. But let's look here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Okay. We're going to see the kind of, of people that God will use for ministry men for preaching and but women can be used in ministry too just the right kind of ministry the right kind of things witnessing and stuff like that to people and and of course you know there are other things that women can do but uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 17 through 21 says here for Christ sent me not to baptize but to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not, gate, hath not God excuse me, made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. It's kind of funny because I've seen this thing. I've, I've met and known a lot of preachers down through the years. And I've seen that a lot of them, the thing that scares them the most is being thought of as a fool. Their uh, reputation, you know. They're scared to death that people are going to think that they're foolish or that they're weird or that they're whatever. They're scared. They don't want to bear the reproach of Jesus Christ. That's a sad thing. Why? Because that's what you're called to be if you're a preacher. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. No way to get around that. 
Look at verse 25 there in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25. It says here, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world, and things which are despised, hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Are you despised by the world? Are you, uh, you know, not mighty, not, not uh, uh, noble, not, you know, considered to be wise? Well, then there's a pretty good chance that God can use you. But if you have a high position in society, the Lord's probably not going to use you for too much. Why? Too much pride. You have too big of a reputation. Because, I mean, you're, you're gonna get, if you get in ministry, you're going to get put down. Okay? I mean, you know, I've had different people say to me, what are your credentials? Well, I have none. You know, I have the book. That's it. The years I've been in ministry, what God's done through the ministry, that's all I can point to. You say, well, you're stupid. I'm not going to listen to you. Okay. See ya. You know, there's nothing else I can do. I can't fall back and say, well, I was educated at, you know, such and such a university. And I have a PhD and I have an honorary doctorate. And I have, there's nothing for me to fall back on but the book. If God does things through the ministry, it's because he's done it, not because of me. I have no power. I'm not a man pleaser. See? But well, let's continue. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. It says here, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay? It was revealed to Paul. We're going to see that in just a couple minutes here, but... I just want to answer something very quickly here. Um, is it wrong to be taught by men? Some people try to say, yes, only the Bible, only the Bible. Well, if I've said that, then let me just clarify what I mean. When you get right down to it, the Bible is your standard. And technically, you only need the Bible. Okay? But you should listen to other men to older men who have been in the ministry who preach from the King James Bible, if they're preaching out of other versions, just no thank you, not going to listen. But listen to other men that preach from the King James Bible or whatever the equivalent is in your language. Listen to them. Learn from them. And you're going to learn some, some things that they're wrong. There are places probably that you're going to think I'm wrong. You know, whatever. That's fine. Okay? This is the standard right here, but you should listen to older men. I'll give you some scripture on this. Second Timothy chapter two verses one and two says, "Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also." All right. So yes, you should be taught by older men, but here's the point: at some time in the future, you need to outgrow the teachers. You need to outgrow. outgrow uh, the preacher, okay? There comes a point in time when you've learned so much, now it is your responsibility to go out and teach other people, all right? If you're a woman, there again, um, I've met some very godly women, okay? And to be quite frank, they've taught me things, not from a teaching position, not from a position up there of authority, okay? Um, you know, the Bible says you're not to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence in the when you have a group of Christians getting together in a congregational meeting there, the church comes together in one place, you know, the woman's not supposed to be in the authority position there. But that doesn't mean that if you're sitting down and you're having just a conversation, brothers and sisters in the Lord, that doesn't mean that the woman is just supposed to sit there the whole time just perfectly quiet. There are times when a woman can speak and say, hey, let me ask you a question. Doesn't the Bible say such and such or doesn't, you know, or they can quote scripture. Okay, there are some very godly women out there. All right. The point is we are supposed to teach one another. And it's among many witnesses. All right. 
many different preachers, many different sermons, things like that. We should have a steady diet of the Word of God coming in. Okay, so yeah, you should be taught by other people, but it always should go back to being filtered through the Word of God. Keep that in mind. But I just want to say this too. As far as this thing of Paul was not taught, it was revealed by the revelation of Jesus Christ, you know, is how he was taught. Let's look about this. In Ephesians chapter 3, go there in your Bible, Ephesians chapter 3, we're going to see that that while Paul was taught some things, you know, uh, actually as a Jew, you know, before he got saved, he was a Pharisee. So he learned a lot about the Old Testament there. But when it came to the New Testament, I mean, there wasn't exactly a finished new copy of the New Testament there for him to read. This stuff was still being revealed to these men. And we're going to see about that here in Ephesians chapter 3. We'll start at verse 1. For this calls I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye, heard, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men at his as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God unto me, given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ." And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So you see it there, that these things, this gospel that was given to Paul, was revealed supernaturally to him. Now, we're not under that same thing here today. You know, we're not under that same setup, if you will. Because what goes on today is, the things that were revealed to Paul and to the other, you know, disciples and things there it's written in a book so god does not have to reveal things in terms of new information that's not available okay that's not there we have the information that we need right here in the king james bible god can show you things from his word he can show you application to what's going on in, in our modern day our modern our modern time people that you meet situations that you get into you'll see it line up with the king james bible but God's not going to reveal new information to you. So, yes, we can have, we can say, you know, that we don't need somebody to teach us everything because we have the finished scriptures here, but a teaching ministry is a good thing. All right? It's, it's something that you can learn a lot, and the Lord can use that. All right? But just be careful always to go back to the King James Bible as your final authority. That's your final authority right there. Go back to the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. It says here, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. All right. So what was Paul's past all about? Well, Acts chapter 22, verses 1 through 5, if you want to go there, we're going to read a little bit about what Paul was before he got saved. Okay, it says here, Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence, and he saith. Before we read verse 3, I just want to make a point there, which I've made in other studies, but if you're new, you might not have heard this. Paul speaks in the Hebrew tongue, but it was translated into Greek. Hmm. One of the attacks that you'll have from these Alexandrian people, the people that support the new versions and attack the King James Bible, attack the uh, King James only system, you know, they'll say no translation can be inspired. Well, that presents a real problem because right here would have been a translation in the original autographs. The New Testament was written in Greek, but Paul spoke in the Hebrew tongue there in verse 2. Hmm. So don't fall for that lie that no translation can be inspired, okay? That's not true, not accurate with the Bible. But let's continue here. Acts chapter 22, verse 3. It says here, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, 
and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women, as also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, excuse me, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. So Paul was a very devout, uh, very zealous Jew, okay, a Pharisee there. But uh, what did Paul think of his credentials after he got saved? This is interesting. Turn in your Bible to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 10. That's what we'll read. It says here, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. You know, you're going to have to do that if you get saved, especially an Orthodox Jew. Those things that are gained to him, you know, and he's got all these, you know, he's a rabbi and he's all these other things and he's got all these honors as a Jewish man. Guess what? Those are gained to you, but you're going to have to count those things loss to get saved. You know, a lot of us, you know, the worst things that really happen to us, uh, Gentile Christians, when we get saved, you know, some people think we're weird, you know. But you get somebody like a Jew or, you know, somebody that's Arabic or whatever, like a, a Muslim, and they get saved, it can cost them their life, many times at the hands of their own family members. You know, that's a bad thing, okay? But look look at here, verse 8, Philippians 3, 8. Uh, yet, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I, that I may win Christ, and be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Okay? That's the way it has to be. Uh, if you are going to be a servant of the Lord, you're going to have to take that old life and just say, well, enough of that. You know, I have to serve the Lord Jesus Christ with my life. James chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Again, you'll see this thing of who God works with, who God works through, who he calls into ministry. It says here, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. You know, I mean, you say, well, Brian, what do I do if I'm rich? Well, you better humble yourself as, as much as you can. Okay, don't trust in those uncertain riches. They can be taken away from you very quickly. You know, the fact of the matter is, if you want to be used by God, you're going to have to take a lowly position. You know, just the way it is. But let's go back to Galatians chapter 1, verse 15. Okay, it says here, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. Okay, we'll stop there. What is this thing about being separated from his mother's womb? Well, if you go to Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, it says, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. So Jeremiah was actually chosen to go out there and be a prophet from his mother's womb. So now you could say, Paul there, it says, separated from his mother's womb, you know, separated me from my mother's womb, there he says. You could say that Paul was chosen of God and he was going to, you know, to write most of the New Testament. But I don't think that's what's going on here, okay? I mean, that's one way to look at it, but I don't really think that that's the proper way to uh, interpret that verse. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 31 and through 32, it says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and 
mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Hmm. You know, one of the names that people come up with for this planet is Mother, Mother Earth, you know? Hmm. Separated me from my mother's womb. You know, God can't use a worldly Christian. If Paul had been worldly, he couldn't have been used of God. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12 that we are not to be conformed to this world. Very interesting. And if you are, you can't prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Can't do it. Can't be done. The Bible says the friend of the world is the enemy of God. What's highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Over and over and over again, you cannot serve God and mammon. All these verses saying you have to be separate. Okay? Kind of like being separated from my mother's womb. Why? Well, as the church there, you know, it says about, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. In Ephesians chapter 5, you need to leave Mother Earth. Okay? Interesting thing. Look at uh, Galatians 1 verse 16. Okay, I'll read verse 15 and 16. It says, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. So, revealing his son in me. What's that about? Well, 1 Peter chapter 3, this is an interesting thing here, because this passage, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, it's speaking to women, but in a sense, there's some spiritual application to both men and women, why? We're the bride of Christ. You know, Ephesians chapter 5 there, you know, uh, man's to leave his father and mother, be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ, the man, and the church, the woman. See? So let's read here in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. It says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. As the bride of Christ, are we supposed to be in subjection to Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Continuing, that if any obey not the word, they may they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. But now look, at, look at verse 4 here in 1 Peter 3. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great Price. So you have there the hidden man of the heart for a woman. So wait a second. Why would a woman have a hidden man in her heart? Well, if she's saved, she's supposed to have the Lord Jesus Christ living in there. She has a hidden man in her heart. And her life is supposed to exemplify the life of Jesus Christ. You're supposed to be like Christ. Be a follower of Christ. See? You are a Christian. Christian. Okay? That's what's going on there. Now go back to Galatians chapter 1, verse 17. Galatians 1, 17. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. What was Paul doing for three years? Well, as the old saying goes, he was uh, learning the ropes. Okay? He was learning how things work. You know, and it's very interesting because one of these things that a lot of people will t teach you if you just got saved, they'll say, you know, you need to be faithful to a local church, which again, that doesn't appear in the Bible, but, you know, you need to be faithful, you need to get in there, you need to just learn and do all these things. Well, that's important to learn. But I'll tell you what's even more important is getting the Word of God out to the lost world. And you can do that if you got saved. If you just got saved watching this sermon, you can get gospel tracts and go pass them out this afternoon. Why? That's what you were saved for. Okay? Yes, you're saved to get you out of hell. Yes, you're saved to go to heaven when you die. But your calling now, the reason God didn't immediately snatch you out of the world, I mean, he could do that. Anybody gets saved, he could just rapture them up right then. But he leaves you here in this world. Why? For the ministry of reconciliation. You are now called into ministry. 
read in Isaiah chapter 55, verses 10 through 11. Here's some interesting things to think about. It says here, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and bringeth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, <clears throat> and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth out of, forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing where I, whereto I sent it. That's very important to get. Okay? Why? Because when you are getting the word of God out there through videos like this, through some kind of radio program that you put out, through quoting scriptures on comments and stuff in YouTube videos or posting scriptures online or whatever you do, gospel tracting, witnessing to co-workers, friends, relatives, neighbors, whatever, whenever you are getting the word of God out, it does not return void. Okay? There's never going to be a time when you're going to get up there to heaven and the Lord's going to say, I sure would like to reward you, but you sure wasted a lot of time down there getting the word of God out. You know, getting my word out there. But gospel tracting? I mean, all that money you spent on gospel tracts, why did you waste your time? That's not going to happen. Okay? You cannot waste your time publishing the word of God, getting this book out through any way that you have today. And there's there are so many ways that we can get the word of God out today that weren't available in the first century. All right? It's just amazing. You can't waste your time serving the Lord. All right? And that's what's going to help you to grow, by the way. But uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 9, just to kind of re reaffirm what's going on here, it says here, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now look at this, verse 9. For we are to laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. You know when you go out and you witness to people, and you go out and you put out tracts and you do whatever, you're laboring with God? Hmm, that's an interesting thought. And I'm going to tell you right now, when you start to do tracting, you'll go someplace and you'll the Lord will prompt you. He'll say, that's a good place for a tract. Look at that handle there on that box. Slip one in there. You know, there's you're in the, the refrigerated section there and there's all the aisle of alcohol, you know, and all the cores, light and everything else. There's a nice hole there. Put the tract in there. Hey, you're in the, the bathroom. Put a tract over there. Put a this, put a there. Put, you know, and as time goes by, you start to get a little bit more courageous and things. And Laurel will say, okay, that guy sitting over there on the bench, go give him a tract. That one over there, go to, you know, the Lord will open up those opportunities for you. You are laboring together with God. And by the way, it says there that God gave the increase in verse 6. Paul planted, Apollos ordered, God gave the increase. It's up to God who gets saved and who doesn't. Your job is not to go out and make sure that there are souls saved. That's God's job. All right? And I dare say that there have been a lot of false conversions that have been made because of uh, overzealous brethren. All right? The fact is, all you are supposed to do is just get the word out. And you can't waste your time doing that. All right? Keep those things in mind. But let's go back to Galatians chapter 1. We'll finish up here. Galatians chapter 1, verses 20 through 24. Okay, it says here, Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by, the, by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. Why didn't Paul speak up? I mean, they're there talking about him. Why didn't he stand up and say, hey, that's me, that's me, that's me? Why? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 14 through 18. We'll read this quick. It says, Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you, 
for all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now let me ask you a very pointed question. What do you think most about? The things which are temporal? The things that you can see around you right now? Or those things that are eternal? You know, it's a real challenge for me right now, as uh, springtime is now upon us finally and it's starting to get warmer outside. Uh, there's a lot of things I'd like to do to really fix the ministry headquarters up and really make it look nice and everything else. But uh, if it's not a necessity, I shouldn't waste my time on it. You say, why is that? Because the Antichrist is going to get this place when we leave at the rapture. See all these books here, all these fancy books and everything, nice, nice bookshelves and stuff that I built there. Who's going to get it? Well, if it's not my relatives, it'll be the military or the police and, and ultimately the Antichrist at the rapture. They're going to get it. Whatever physical possessions you have here on earth are going to be somebody else's property 10 seconds after the rapture happens. You're not going to care about it. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Those are the things that you're going to give God glory for. All right? What you've done in your life. And I'll tell you, you gotta, you got to keep that stuff in mind. you got to stay focused on eternity. Focused on those eternal things. All right? Paul could have easily stood up there when he was there in Galatia. When he had gone there and they were talking about him, he could have easily stood up and said, Hey, it's me, it's me, it's me. I'm Paul, I'm Paul. He could have done that. But he chose instead just to sit there and just be quiet. Just kind of look around and, well, they're really giving glory to God. See, they can't give it to me because they don't know who I am. But they're glorifying God because of what I've been doing. I praise the Lord when I hear people say, you know, that they've been changed by this ministry. That God has blessed them through this ministry. I praise the Lord for that. But I don't ever want to take that credit away from the Lord. I have no natural ability. I am nothing. What I have, what I do here, is simply because the Lord speaks through me. You know, I'm not perfect. I'm not, you know, flawless or whatever. Just, you know, if, if you've been blessed by this ministry, well, give, give praise to the Lord. You know, it's just the way it is. You know, what you do in your life should bring glory to the Lord after you're saved. Okay? Very, very important to remember that. Stay focused on eternity. All right? So let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you, Lord, for the challenge from your word today. I just uh, really just pray for everybody out there that they would not get caught up in these other gospels, Lord, that they would not back away from what your word says. Lord, we need to, to be a people that takes stands against sin and uh, warn people about the sins and the need for repentance, Lord. I just pray for that. I pray that we would not be um, hounded and put down by these these people that come along and they try to preach these other gospels and try to get us back under the law and try to get us to you know, doubt our salvation if we've sinned in the flesh. And I just pray, Lord, that you would just help us to stay focused on eternity and that uh, if somebody out there is not... Uh, actively witnessing, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict them and that they would seek to do something for you, Lord, uh, because we have very short time here on this earth. And I just pray, Lord, for those that are uh, doing well and uh, walking in fellowship with you, I pray, Lord, that they would continue in those things and not, not uh, get sidetracked on the things of this, this earth and this world. And I just ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All righty. That's going to be it for chapter one. 
we're going to go on to chapter two here uh, next week. And uh, I'm going to be recording these sermons back to back because there are some things that that uh, we do need to I do need to build and take care of here and things at the ministry headquarters. Um, so a lot of things to do. I'm going to be releasing the whole uh, Galatians expository study one chapter every week and some videos inter interspersed in with that. But uh, some of the bigger videos I have planned that I'm researching for right now um, are going to be put off for a little while simply because, like I said, right now there's still a lot of work. I had to wait for a lot of this work till the temperature started to get a little bit warmer. Um, it's been real cold here, so uh, I just needed to wait for this time here now, and, and now it's getting warmer, and so I can get some work done. So I'm not going to be uh, putting out some real big studies here, um, but uh, they will be coming in the future. Uh, so uh, please keep us in your prayers. Um, and I uh, just wanted to thank everybody for your prayers, uh, those that do pray for us. Um, and I thank you also to everybody out there who donates to the ministry. Uh, God will bless you for that. Okay, um, I was told by numerous brethren that I shouldn't be uh, sending thank you notes and things like that to people. That it's that it's kind of I'm kind of violating the thing of when you give to the Lord, it's you know not to let your what is it? Your right hand let know what your left hand is doing. I always get those that order confused. But you're not to to make a big show of it. So a lot of people are like, I don't feel comfortable you saying thank you. So I'll just thank you this way. Okay, no personal thank you notes or anything. But thank you to everybody out there who donates to the ministry. Um, when you donate, you'll see the fruit of that giving coming out through the ministry. Okay, it enables us to continue full time in this. Um, and I really do appreciate that. We couldn't do it without uh, people giving the gifts to the ministry. And so I thank you for that. I pray every night for your for God to bless those who donate and those that are praying, the friends of the ministry. I, I'm so thankful. Um, we go through some rough times, and uh, I've been attacked. I made a video about that already, the thing of uh, uh, physical encounters with the spiritual realm. I'm going to be talking a little bit more about some of those types of subjects in the future. The thing about discerning of spirits and things like that. Um, there have been some some major attacks, uh, and there and there it's not going to be like oh well, you know I was attacked in the past, but now I'm not anymore. No, you know as long as I'm in ministry, I know I'm going to be attacked. But uh, that's why we need your prayers. Uh, just that's a a very important thing. So this is actually the second time I've recorded this message. Uh, the first time, which was uh, yesterday. I was trying to, I've been having trouble with my audio setup, and I tried um, checking over all my connections and putting new batteries in my wireless mic system, and and it just did not work. Uh, I do have a wired mic system, and that thing, you know, I don't, I'm not even sure where it is right now. I haven't used it in a long time, but the batteries are dead in that, so I don't have the batteries for it and everything. And blah, blah, blah. So I'm using... A recorder right here um, this is the one I've used for years and years and years uh, for doing sermon audio and um, it does a very good job so I'm gonna be using this recorder I'm working on some other ways to do the recording of the audio so you don't get that thing my whole sermon from yesterday it's all it was like that so I had to redo the whole thing start over so uh, just Keep us in your prayers because we get attacked from every angle. I mean, it's incredible, you know. But uh, the studies we have coming out, I'm sure, are going to really tick the devil off. And I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, bringing out some more information and things to really make a fool out of him and make problems for his kingdom. So uh, that's going to be it. Thank you very much for watching, and we will see you next week with Galatians chapter 2.